Software piracy bridged the technological gap, bridged the eastern part of Europe and the west after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Ah, welcome mateys to a special-ish, let's say, episode of Game Chronicles. And that's about it for my accent. I'm Steven Nonsense and this is my rather old scallywag of a friend, Unicom. Hey Unicom. Avast me hearties, yo ho. Bottle up that rum and walk the poop plank or whatever they say in pirate land, yarhar. Scurvy dog. Scurvy dog. Yeah. Well, what we'll be doing what we'll be doing this episode is I want us to have a a very different discussion about software piracy. This, this should come out around or even on a talk like a party day, hence the R at the beginning and whatnot. Yeah. But it is a good, it, it's as good of any of, uh, of a reason to have a discussion, have a different type of discussion about software piracy and a little bit about hardware piracy. That's uh, at least as far as I know, hasn't really been, doesn't exist, hasn't really been done out there. So what we'll talk about in this episode uh, in as much as we can in this, uh, in the allotted time frame, is the, what, what piracy meant to the countries, in our case Romania, but to the countries that used to be beyond the Iron Curtain. And in order to set that up a little bit, uh, both Unicom and myself are uh, Romanian. We are both close to our 40s, let's say, which means... And we're uh, pirates, to be honest. I mean, we are... Oh, 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 yes. Which means we grew up during the 90s. And Romania stopped being a communist country right at the very end of 1989, thus starting its access into and transition into like a free market economy right from the 1990s onwards. Slow descent into madness is also a good uh, way to describe it. That's fair enough, but we're not talking about the politics here necessarily, although uh, there's gonna be just a slight, slight mention of legality here and there. But the idea is, and this is, this is a difficult point to impart to someone who was in the west someone who was literally at the we to the west of the berlin wall is that where the 1990s for us meant com a completely different thing basically than the 1990s for the occidental west as it was as we would we were still calling it back then basically let me um, put it this way if you yeah. have memories of your childhood of going down to best buy or to uh, blockbuster and renting a video game you are an alien to us. Exactly. And this show will be completely removed from any experience you ever had in your life. And that's why I think we need to talk about this because I haven't, I, again, I haven't seen, I haven't, it hasn't reached my eyeballs or my uh, ear balls. No, or, or ears don't have balls. They, they have the thing at the end. Yeah, or my ear bones. Balls, bones, it's close enough. And we're going to go with Ballot that one. bones, your heart. Arr. The first 4A game. We can't even talk about the experience of Romania uh, as a whole. We can only talk about our uh, individual experiences. Thankfully, we didn't grow up uh, in not even in the same regions of the country. So it's it, it, there, there's going to be some differences. But what 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 is valid for the entire country is that in my estimation, when we started the 1990s, the general level of technology in in any sort of realm you can think about, I estimate we were somewhere around like 15 to 20 years behind the West. By the by the 2000s, we had caught up to a certain degree. So that's why I'm just saying it's like 15 to 20, depending on the department. As an example, because I love to give this example, because this is an example for uh, experienced people like ourselves. For the first half of the 90s, you may remember that, you know, listening to music was basically the gaming of the 80s more or less and it was always a very popular sort of thing to do well whilst the west in 1990 already uh, was already transitioning to cds in the beginning in the first part of 1990s romania if you were the owner of a real to real player and if it was a recorder then parking of a real to real playback device that was the epitome of high fidelity. And I'm not saying I'm not saying it, it, it. They're not. They're good. They're good machines still. But just so that you get an idea of where technology sort of like that's mass consumer technology. 
in the West, people had uh, CDs and stuff. And for us, like the epitome of audio hi-fi was a reel-to-reel. If you've ever seen, if any anybody watching this has ever seen the movie uh, Your Trip, the Bratislava section describes us. So that like one minute they spend in Bratislava, that's us. Please continue. The kind of the same thing applies to um, everything else, every other domain of tech. At that point in time, we were starting to literally from the 1990s onward, we were starting to get access to, you know, like media from the West. And we will see all sorts of like phones with buttons on them. Even the phones that like sometimes they were phones that didn't even have to be locked into a wall uh, that had buttons. He's on. talking about dial phones, like fixed phones, not mobile phones. Landlines. Those yes, were sci-fi technology we'd only see like around the year 2000. Yeah, that's that's that that is correct. So there were all of these things that we would see on TV, and we're like, that's. That's crazy. That's crazy. So I just offered the music example. Like, of course, we had we had cassettes, but that and that's gonna play into where my gaming history begins, uh, both with gaming and piracy of both types. That kind of applies to everything else. Uh, anything you can imagine. It was at least twenty years older than it was when you were in the '90s, somewhere in the uh, somewhere in the West. Elevator technology whatever what th don't even get me started on television i still i used a black and white television for most of the 90s for my gaming for instance the old uh, diamant were they were they were great i didn't have a diamant i had an alt actually it was an alt uh yeah, it was it had a pretty it had a pretty cool design it was like small it was like this big so it was a bit more movable <laughs> it was a bit more mobile for gaming purposes Did it have a glass fish on top of it no, no, no. Uh, my family didn't didn't roll with that. Uh, we we weren't those types of people. Anything actually? Uh, there's a show on Netflix, uh, Dairy Girls. It's about uh, people in Ireland in the '90s. Yep. They had that. They, yes. they had a fish on their TVs. They're yeah. like us. They pronounce exactly. the name Mihai just like we do. We are kindred spirits. Let's kill the British. Well, we do also. We we have a, a strange a strange amount of commonalities with the celtic peoples in general both oh, both of them used to be around here so we, we, we both ireland is them. yeah both ireland and scottish like uh, we have yeah. bagpipes and sort of haggis so it's kind of it, yeah. there's some stuff there but also in yeah, Derigal, the, the, by the way Derigal, great show um they also have mileuri in case you yeah. haven't noticed yeah so uh, when it when it comes when it comes to uh com, com, to gaming that wasn't necessarily, it wasn't a concept per se. Computing, computers were known to exist. But they happened to other people. They, they usually did happen to other people who were on TV or you know at, at some institution if, if, if and whatever. And, and we're talking about, and we're talking about like the, 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 what would be mainframe computers, but they really weren't. When it comes to consumer grade stuff, and we need to we should like the entirety of the eastern bloc should celebrate the birth and or death of sinclair because the zx spectrum due to the way in which it was designed it was designed to be uh, easy to build cheap uh, microcomputer that meant that it also was considerably easier to close that's yeah, where we start our somebody who used to build them out of parts they'd find in a scrap heap somewhere from an industrial site and that was something that was happening all throughout like the spectrum zx or the spectrums or the the zx's but the spectrum zx is where i started from so i can talk about that one yeah i'm kind of the same boat as well that had been cloned all throughout the eastern Bloc. in romania in particular i think there were several versions of it i know of about three or four with different names and such one of them was called like the the most famous one in romania was called the home computer uh, which we which we shortened to hc or hc and there were several versions of the cobra yeah, yeah the second one would be the second one would be um a clone called the cobra which is what i had i actually had a cobra Spectrum ZS clone. Cobra, by the way, um, and I'll try to find images and uh, put them as we talk about them. Cobra stands for the CEO is from computers and the bra is from Brashov, which is a city where these things were being made. 
it's the city that uh, Hitman uh, 47 visits in Hitman 1, 2, and 3, the, the remakes. And there we go. We... By, by the way, the, the company in that uh, that uh, series, uh, Kronstadt, that's the name that Brashov had under the German... Uh... That's a whole other historical di uh, difference, but yeah, uh, discussion. But uh, Unicom coming in with the gaming reference to make things even more uh, easily uh, relatable. With. There was also something called the Ice Felix, then there was another one called Cheap. And I'm pretty sure there were a, the, the, there's a bunch more that I don't know necessarily. I will do my best to track down a bit of info and just uh, and just display it as you hear this. And keep in mind, these these were these were commercially available. Like these were built and sold. There's a bunch more that were just assembled out of spare parts. Exactly. People which used to just make if they had yeah. the skills. Due to the intricacies, let's say the inherent oh. issues with uh, the implementation of the communist system by uh, humans. Um, a lot of these spare parts, as Unicom called them, would be would would become would be available on the black market, which is one of the sort of offshoots of a of a, any sort of you know um, not necessarily just communist, but in general very uh, controlling uh, authoritative uh, sort of. Um, system of governance it also helped if you knew somebody who worked at a let's say semi-sophisticated uh, plant or production company you know, something that specialized in industrial equipment they tended to have devices that could actually write uh, the roms the rom memory on the, the chips which is uh, what happened in brela because we had our, our big uh, you know steel mill that had some a few, like a, a small number of uh, equipment that was computerized-ish. Yeah. We're still like 20 years behind everybody in terms of computerization of uh, industry. But they had that uh, device that actually let you write uh, the memory itself. And somebody found a way to clone the actual uh, ZX Spectrum uh, you know, instructions at the uh, operating system and they uh, kept making chips with it. Hey, we get a uh, sort of a bloody cat. Yeah, blurry cat, yeah. Um, oh, come on. It doesn't recognize cat faces. Okay, we need no. an AI. There we go. <gasps> Pretty cat. We're taking, uh, taking a break out of our piracy discussion to look at the cat. Look at uh, Unicom's cat called Poofy, which means fluffy. Yes, it does. And she's shedding all over me right now. It is. It's a good thing. It's a good thing it's not the go other. Go destroy the couch. As we were saying, like, there was the, the, the black market, there was a black market of, of related to anything that came from the West. That that can be a different discussion, we can go into a ve uh, into a different... Uh, but like Unicom said, uh, you tended to get access to these things, for, like you know a guy who knew a guy. And in particular, if you sort of worked in the domain and stuff. The, the, the thing that I was lucky... Uh, with is that my dad uh, was and still is uh, very much into electronics so he obviously knew some people back then back then there was you needed to know people because there weren't actually you know stuff a, a lot of access to stuff so uh, he knew some people who basically built him a cobra clone for myself and my elder brother that is one of the things that I was lucky with that I actually had a spectrum ZX clone growing up and i'm gonna say it, i'm gonna say it for the rest of my life one of my first if not the first memory i have is of me watching a video game on the spectrum zx and the video game in question is called penetrator which is a really weird title for now especially for nowadays <laughs> but it was a it's a it's it, it itself is a clone of an arcade title called Scramble, I believe. So that is where sort of my gaming career slash history begins. I, I tend to say, I like to say it starts when I'm five, because you know, like looking back, that should kind of be around the time that that memory should have been created. So yeah, I consider myself being a gamer since the age of five generally what was your sort of uh well what was your situation in about that same time like 1990 to 95 let's say like the first half of the 90s well well in 1992 my dad left for uh, ukraine to work at building a town and then a steel mill and around there they used to have all sorts of flea markets and uh, selling your know, surplus uh, and he, he sent us um 
three uh, computers. One of them was an uh, Electronica MS0511, which I, I made a show about it uh, a few years ago. It, it didn't come with any attachments, with any of the you know, actual memory thingamabobs you would need to make it run properly. You, you just had RAM on it. You could, you could not really run anything, you could not program anything into it without the, the extensions. Only much, much later did I see that you could actually get it to run like some really nifty games that looked looked quite good like they looked amazing it was black and white but still it was amazing the other, the other one was it was a clone of a zx spectrum it ran um basic it ran you know uh, basic uh, my brother actually was learning at the um, at a school he had an optional class where they were taught programming and he used to bring you know programs written on on a, uh, a you know notebook and we typed them into the computer. I, some, I actually got to memorize a couple of them. There was a really good program with uh, guessing the number, a bingo style game. So guess the number, and I memorized that one. There was also an amazing one that, uh, depending on what number you wrote, it would draw on the screen all sorts of weird shapes, and it was super fantastic. I had a program that let a man like walk on the screen. Well, it wasn't a man, it was a stick figure. Yeah, uh, yeah. I could never get that one to work. For some reason, I guess, uh, I think our uh, ZX Spectrum may maybe didn't have enough memory. Possible. Also, it, um, it had a f couple of issues with actually connecting it to a cassette player. So we, we had a bunch of cassettes for, you know, games that we got from around the neighborhood from people who actually had the working model. Uh, none of them worked, sadly. Uh, I didn't get to actually play on it, uh, basically, at all. I mostly played on a computer that was, I think it was an actual Cobra from uh, from a friend in the neighborhood. Uh, he loaned it to me for a couple of days at one point, and I basically stayed up until like the middle of the night just trying to see uh, which games worked. Uh, the one that I said that I never got to actually play was Elite. I had it on a oh, tape and never got trust to play me. it. Yeah, trust me, Elite would have been... Uh, would, even if you got it to work, it's, it, yeah. it was it was quite the experience. Elite yeah, on, the, I, on the Spectrum ZX uh, without a manual. Oh, I imagine it would have been horrible. I mean, I had trouble understanding something as simple as... Uh, what was it? Renegade? The prequel to uh, Double Renegade, Dragon. Renegade D, probably. That's that, yeah, that's the one it, that was, it was that the I played. was where the, uh, the motorcycles throw showed up. Target Renegade... Uh, or, yeah, target training, I think it was. I had trouble understanding how controls work in that one. Can I go up? Can I go down? What button do I press to, you know, uh, jump, to attack? It's, yeah, I, I don't even think it had arrow keys uh, on the keyboard back then. I, at the Star version didn't have. Yeah. It, it was a lot harder to get into games back then. Um, the was, third computer. Uh, it also had time. Go, go, go. Yeah, the third computer was just a keyboard, which, to be fair, they were all just keyboards. But this one was a lot slimmer than all the other ones. So we never figured out if it was an actual computer or just a keyboard. I, I don't know what happened to it because at one point, uh, it, I think my mother or my brother gave it away. But eventually we gave them all away to uh, the other two away to a cousin of mine who then moved to Italy and now they're lost to history, unfortunately. I would have, I would have really loved to see at least that uh, MS uh, Electronica computer back again. Because that thing... It was all in Russian. Here's the thing. They were all in Russian. Everything on them was in Russian. So even getting something to run on them to understand how something functioned was a challenge. Uh, it, was, it wasn't easy. Like it, it was an oilingly, really annoyingly difficult to get anything to work on them, to understand how anything should work on them in the first place. I'm glad you mentioned cassettes. For those of you who may be somewhat younger or who hadn't didn't go through the microcomputer stage of home computing, let's say, of home gaming, games and software, um, as we know, could be also uh, recorded on magnetic tape. That's how diskettes and disks and floppies and whatnot still worked. But the, the miniature cassette, it, it's called miniature cassette, right? Or is it just cassette? It's just a cassette. It's uh, the... Uh... I forget. It was the eight track versus compact. The cassette, I, I think, think it. I think it's the, the compact. compact cassette. It's called the compact cassette. Ba basically, what we what we're referring to is like audio cassettes. What we call them. These used to have games and software on it, and ideally, the the only thing you needed really to run it would be just something that like a a cassette player that you that could send signal into your uh, Spectrum ZX. Now, there's some differentiation there as well. Depending on the quality of your cassette player, uh, 
this process could work or not work but this process would almost always work if you had a digital cassette player which were which were a very niche product designed specifically specifically for this if you were to put a music tape in the digital cassette player it would sound like nothing you like skrillex is true music is is the is is a symphony uh, compared to what running a music tape through a digital uh, cassette player would be software and games being on cassettes meant they were supremely easy to pirate this is something that this is something that i'm pretty sure has been talked about at least from like uh, the the british um content creators out there because that's where microcomputing more or less started at least for at least for europe and i'm sure they talk about this as well but again our perspective is is a it's a wholly different one because one of the reasons why we pirated starting from that point onwards is the simple fact that we didn't actually there there was not there, there was no access it, it was not easy to find games for instance at the newsstands as it was in the uk for instance or with magazines that was in at the, for the beginning of the 90s that was still a super foreign concept for us one of the reasons for uh, engaging with piracy that early on was simply to literally as a means of getting access to any sort of software or game that you could much like unicom said he spent the time just seeing what would work for a long for for a lot of time because you, you never actually knew and when you whenever you got something it was like oh let's see what let's see what this is if it works because one of the uh, disadvantages of magnetic tapes, which is uh, one of the reasons why we don't really use them except for massive storage, which that's an interesting news article in a separate thing. They're really easy to corrupt and they do degrade over time within 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 human lifespan. <laughs> they will degrade. It, they, they tend to die. They will degrade tremendously. Also, the more you read them the more they get read the the more they get degraded as well so yeah that's provided that the uh, the cassette player itself doesn't eat it which you would do constantly yeah which goes back to the quality of your player so the idea is that sometimes some portions of some tapes would not work regardless whether it was new or not and you know it was a lot of trial and error whilst i was not super directly involved with the not not no longer black market because so the black market existed during communism but right afterwards there was no not, not a lot of need for black market on this because basically anything could be sold for a while i'll get back to that in a bit and uh, anything could be sold for any sort of price that that has to do with other things every anyone basically could copy a game tape and then take it to a uh, consignment store and if the tape sold they would get a little bit of a little bit of something and that would be uh, like incentive or not incentive to make more now whilst i wasn't mm, super directly involved with this i was indirectly involved with this be because my brother used to do this and when he used to do this i had to wait and not use the computer i i have been indirectly part of the uh, the active part of old school tape piracy for software at least at least for a little bit of part for a, a little bit of time in a little in a very small part of romania now if i would have been older i think that would have been maybe larger but that's a different discussion the idea is that this was very uh, easy to do and yeah we did it because again access was limited and whenever something new showed up the community the people like i know a friend who knows a friend it, it would eventually spread to a larger sort of population it's worth mentioning that we weren't causing any sort of uh, how should i put it uh, loss to publishers and developers because they weren't selling it in our country like nobody was importing it nobody could buy it legally like at all no one yeah that it is... wasn't here yeah okay so i'm glad you i'm glad you brought this up now uh, need to make we need to clarify some stuff between the years 1990 and 1996 romania had no copyright laws on the books why because it used to be a communist country that shit don't fly in communist countries under communism in general so basically whatever you did 
with any type of media between 1990 and 1996 when the law came into uh, uh, came into force was fair game pirating and distributing anything music movies books oh my god there was so many random weird books that were translated not even well translated sometimes that showed up uh, like at the beginning of the 90s you can't even you literally cannot imagine unless you live back then and there every all of that was fair game for like the first six years of the 90s in the sense of legality under the governance that you live in none of this was illegal it didn't even exist basically as far as legality is concerned no, it did piss off some people um uh, one of my neighbors was uh Nelu vlad who is a local music sensation like if you know the song uh, la noi la brahila la tanti elvira which is you know about the prostitution in brahila he was extremely upset like super pissed that basically in the early 90s everybody made money on his music except for him like he made nothing from his recordings nothing but everybody who had like a stand with cassettes in the market would make a ton of money based on his work. It's sort of like Spotify today, or basically the music industry today. Everybody but the artist makes music. That, that's how it was in the wild west of no legal protection for the artist. It's, it's strange to see the similarities between anarchy and capitalism it's weird it is and that's why it's important to own your publishing rights uh artists young young or older artists it's a good thing that you brought that up because that that did happen and that will inevitably happen regardless how much even if the laws exist and they are enforced which sort of happened as we go through time the piracy still persisted for the same reasons but extra one you mentioned something earlier about newsstands so yes that still is in many parts uh, in many areas actually of romania a very popular way of uh, getting movies and uh, music but back then at the beginning of the 90s it was also where you would get a little bit later on uh, where you'd get uh, cds pirated software and game cd so after 96 we have this we have a copyright law again due to the inherent corruption that is inbuilt that 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 develops if you pay the right people they would ignore you and tell somebody that's um, that's asking way more money than you can bribe them with uh, would notice once that person came in yeah you would have to pay a fine your store didn't go out of business because it's still there like Chedarom from Marila. It's, it's, it's still alive it still exists it doesn't sell pirated video games anymore but it did for about a decade there were also, there were also the more like sort of um, I like to call them like indie distributors. It was just a random bunch of people who just like owned one of these newsstands. Let's call them kiosks, maybe, but they weren't that advanced. They would be in direct sort of contact, like uh, pirates. People who would do the, the pirating would contact them and bring them stuff they would display it, and then people would buy it or not buy it, and you know th that's kind of how we interpreted and used the the concept of the free market and how supply and demand worked and feedback functioned in a very parallel underground sort of way because at this point in time it was clearly illegal no one really gave that much of a shit because again corruption is a thing that is still very much very unfortunately way too prevalent way more prevalent considerably more prevalent than it should be and back then it was also that like no one knew anything but no one was it, it was it, living through and growing through that transitional decade is a type of it's a type of experience that i would wish on no one especially growing up in that type of a transitional decade economically socio-economically speaking from 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 a lot of points of view but now we are in the uh, I, I kind of jumped up to the CD. We need to mention that about this time, about the mid 90s, when I say mid 90s, you think like 93, 94 to about 97, we started gaining access to the part, quite possibly the best console in history. But before that, uh, there's one thing I have to mention that um, a lot of people made money on those pirated uh, tapes and those pirated CDs. A lot of people, not the not you know the owners of the rights but they made money and there was no crystallization moment there was no eureka moment around here like at all like something that happened in poland in poland 
CD Projekt existed because it pirated games. That's what they did. They, they sold pirated games until at one point they said, hey, we're making a lot of money in these. What if, what if we, what if we just import the game and you know pay for it and then sell it and yes. make money like that? It That's was much more fragmented. Yeah. yeah, here it was just like everybody's up for themselves. Nobody's thinking of the day after tomorrow. It's just about how much money can I get? Uh, you know, th th this day tomorrow and. That's it. Again, a poor There's interpretation. A no term idea. A poor idea. understanding only... and interpret a poor understanding and interpretation of American style capitalism to a yeah, certain nobody degree. knew what they were doing exactly. There was only one glimmer of hope with uh, Nemira, which was a publish a book publisher like in the olden days. It's still around. Still they around. actually tried to become a game publisher and make their own game. The funding just vanished. It went poof. They had like two or three games in development with some of the people that were you know, still in the games industries. They're like they're really talented people. Um, Andre Fontin is one of them. He worked on worked Ubisoft on a bunch of games. I think he worked with uh, Peter Jackson on uh, the King Kong game as well. Anyway, um, we never we never got to see any of those any of those profits made from pirated video games being actually used to. A nourish to uh, grow a local gaming culture or local gaming market none Poland had it yeah I God think uh, damn bastards. but as I was saying like just before we get into that era we need to address the era of the uh, as I was saying possibly the best uh, console uh, uh, in history for the most amount of um, for the for the largest uh, portion of the globe I mean now let me finish this time. Yeah, the, none other than the Family Clone. Yeah, this is why I wonder. Do you have a Rambo when you were growing up, or do you, you did, know somebody who had a Rambo? I did not. I think I knew someone. I knew they existed, and we're gonna mention them immediately. But we need to start with the big hitters, and the big hitters was none other than the Family Clone, of which, which in Romania, oddly enough, uh, it was not called Ending Man, which is just odd usually they'd say ending man on the the stuff on like the controllers but no in romania it was for whatever reason marketed as the terminator 2 so and it, not the terminator it was the terminator 2 and it literally had a picture a pretty good a pretty decently resolution picture on the box of arnold schwarzenegger in terminator 2 which is, did, did your box have in his glasses like the white house reflected i don't remember also i didn't have actually a terminator 2 i had the famiclone famiclone mine actually mine actually said nintendo and shit on it i know this wanky kind of uh, uh it was well it was much later on in the, like the, as time went on the clones got better and better uh, by the way so the terminator and i'll try to show pictures because i still have the pictures we used back in our game tales episode the terminator 2 looked much more like a Mega Drive 2 mm -hmm. than anything else. Uh, also, the controllers look like that from the Mega Drive 2 as well. Uh, but the insides were a Famiclone, definitely. Yeah, I'm still a bit upset uh, about mine because I gave it to that cousin of mine who's in Italy right now. And mine was a red one. Like, the, the top part was red, the bottom part was gray. The controllers, one was red, one was gray. Like, those wore out, like, instantly. I replaced them with the standard black ones. But still, apparently, that red, gray one was sort of a limited, super limited edition because I can't yeah. find any evidence on the web that it existed. I have, yeah, I haven't actually heard of that. Uh, but we should also mention that uh, Famiclones came in a bunch of weird shapes and sizes. For instance, I had a friend who had one that was shaped like the Batmobile, which I gotta say, as a Batman fan, that's pretty dope. But it still was just a Famiclone on the inside. But back to your mention earlier of which might seem weird of the Rambo, of Rambo. Oh, yeah. Rambo. You, you had the Terminator, you know, Snigger. Of course you'd have the Rambo. Stallone. I mean, Makes sense. What, yeah, so... what we were missing was a Jean-Claude Van Damme one. Ooh, there needed to be a what, Sega clone with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah, but I, I also... I'm a, like, a, like a Master System. Yeah, that would have been dope. But from my understanding, that would have been way harder to pirate. Yeah, uh, at least so. at least for the, the size of the market. Because I know that happened a lot in Brazil. You can't compare the sizes of the of the markets, uh, even back in the 90s. So what the Rambo was, much like the Terminator 2, the Rambo was a repackaged version of the Atari, I want to say 2600, but I'm not sure which. Yeah, exactly so it was, that one. yeah, it was a repackage of the Atari 2600, 
which is port, again no, like it, it came with a fake cartridge port it was just a piece of plastic you couldn't stuff anything in it but it also had a, a couple of chips on it which came uh, preloaded with uh, about a hundred games depending on which uh, Rambo you got you would have different games and for some reason sometimes some of them would not unlock unless you had to fiddle with the dials in a certain way I'm not exactly sure how it worked you basically cycle between them between the various like uh, memory banks of games there, there was also this, this this parallel sort of thing we tend to focus and then we, we generally focus our discussion on PC gaming because that's the main thing we did but we also had occasional access to console yeah initially However, but, console yeah. gaming was a lot more accessible because you know the, the Rambo was a lot cheaper than a, than a Spectrum and because you had the, the games built in there was no need for anything else I mean, exactly. you would need, it was... like, uh, you know, controllers, uh, joysticks, because they would break quite easily. But other than that, it, it was all built in. It, it was easily accessible. And as time went on, consoles, like, uh, the clones stopped existing, and you had to get the actual, you know, Super NES. You had to get the PlayStation if you wanted to actual, get actual consoles. And those those cost a lot more than a, a, an old cheap computer and you couldn't really pirate on them as you can still you can still find the pirate the knockoff versions now as well but there was a time there where you're right when it comes to the family clones and the well the rambo didn't need cartridges but the family clones did and uh those are also pirated of course where we would get those from that is its own uh, that is its own sort of Balkan type thing. Uh, we would generally get them from a sort of, let's say, flea market, you would call it, but it's more of a organized bazaar, actually, than a flea market that usually happens once a week at the outskirts of a large-ish town. Uh, we, 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 we call that... Call it the we, Russian market. We used to call it the Russian market. We generally, in my region, we call it Obor. The idea is just to just for the people who have no idea what we're talking about, why uh, uh, in Unicom's part they would call it the Russian market is that most of the uh, let's say import stuff, most of the knockoff stuff, people would say come from the Russians. It was basically uh, partially true, but factually incorrect. The people who brought it spoke Russian because they came from what is now the Republic of Moldova which used to be part of Romania back before the Second World War. And in, in Moldova right now, they mostly speak uh, Romanian, but there is a big part that still speaks Russian. So the more entrepreneurial of them would, would definitely ac had access to the wider post-Soviet market by this point in time. This was already, uh, we, are, we are past the, the, the wall falling and whatnot, now in the mid 90s. And you would find, and they would bring in a lot of knockoff stuff, amongst which I, I need to mention a couple of things, amongst which sometimes the most popular stuff were cigarettes. You like, you think, if you think software piracy is bad, you don't, you, you, you have, you have no idea how many like knockoff cigarettes came into the country, came in and through the countries without any sort of tax on them and shit like that. Oh yeah. Like, um... For a while, the main occupation of the Romanian military was, you know, importing contraband uh, cigarettes. That's 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 what they did. It shut the population and then imported uh, cigarettes. That Illegal. was that was a that was a that was a thing that was sort of happened for a while there. Again, like much like Unicom said, it was a rough decade to it was a rough decade yeah. to go through. But so the idea is the cartridges were also pirated and we would get sometimes, sometimes we would get like really weird knockoff -y stuff like that only, only it, it, the, the, there was nothing, it wasn't translated in English. Which uh, 299 million of them were uh, basically different ROMs of Super Mario World or Super, Super uh, Mario Bros. Super Mario Brothers and um, what we call Tank, but what is actually called yeah. Battle City. Yeah, but so, ba so Battle City for us is tank with an exclamation mark. That's how that's how we know it as. That's what got me into game development. It's it's a level editor. It was a fun game, man. This leads to a this leads to an interesting sort of phenomenon that is uh, very much relegated to our chunk of Europe because most of us only interacted with gaming for like most of the '90s, let's say, and even a bit 
into the mid 2000s, depending on possibilities, only interacted with gaming through the Fami clones. That meant, uh, and I'm talking from my perspective here, that meant we had no idea classics existed. What do I mean? Up until I had the internet, up until uh, I had broadband internet, let's say in 2004, I had never heard the word Castlevania. Now, I knew a lot about PC gaming because I was interested in PC gaming. I knew a lot of other games on the arcade. We had arcades, that's a different discussion. And we also uh, had the uh, Famiclone, but I had never heard Castlevania, of Castlevania. I had never heard of Legend of Zelda. Um, or Metroid. Or, or Metroid. Any, any Mario after the first one. Basically anything that required a, an extra chip or anything that required extra memory or got for got a, a battery to you know keep save games. That those are no, because those were expensive to actually make. And uh, the cartridges we bought, they weren't full priced. Like they they cost. There was something that I could afford, and I could barely afford my own underwear at some point. Yeah, yeah that, that's something, Yeah, it, it's good that you point that out because it's something I forget to mention, like uh, one, uh, another major reason for piracy, even once uh, things started to become somewhat available legally, was that their prices were prohibitive for 90-ish percent of the population, maybe 95 plus percent of the population the prices were prohibitive. We needed to mention that the, the fact that the Famic clone did leave its mark on, um, on like gaming culture in general, or where we come from. For some of us, like myself, that is basic, basically where gaming, where console gaming started and ended, because I was always, I was always just interested in computers, in PCs and stuff. So now, roughly again we're going just roughly just for the ease of creating a sort of a timeline we are now in the late 90s so think of it like 97 to 2000 things aren't as horrific necessarily as they were at the beginning of the 90s they're not great mind you but uh, it's arguably better we started getting internet cafes so it was it was something. yeah that that is that's an important inflection point i feel in in the development of uh, in, in like the development of society and also uh, from a techno anthropological sort of standpoint that's about when uh, internet cafes sort of uh, exploded as a subculture subculture sub community you can say uh, within itself internet existed i mean internet access existed but it was supremely expensive as an individual it wasn't really attainable up until much later so internet cafes were a very affordable uh, in between were, were a very affordable sort of um uh, offer both for entertainment spending an evening out with your friends going out like instead of going out and drinking basically which is something we did, still do, in the region a lot. Instead of doing that, uh, we tended to maybe just go to the internet cafe for the equivalent amount of money that we would have spent on drinks. We would spend a couple of hours in the internet cafe. We used to have a term for that, we used to call it a long, which is basically you spend a long night at the internet cafe, sometimes to the early mornings. Internet cafes, everything was pirated. Let's, let's let's keep it real like let, let, let's be sure let, 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 let's us be honest windows all pirated all the time starcraft razor 1911 buddy like oh, there is no there's no there, in some games you just see like the razor logo in, superimposed over the start button because that's how that's how razor worked like in each for speed 5 it was the razor logo instead of the need for speed logo when you hit race uh, the internet cafes helped with teaching more or less to a certain like introducing the concept the general concept of internet to uh wider to the wider masses uh then would have been possible otherwise but in parallel to this cds by this point in time the uh, economy the economic status was kind of improving like macroeconomically speaking and uh, CDs were easier to get hold of. Even so, audio CDs were still maybe maybe a bit too expensive in some circumstances. You would still generally look at CD players as a pretty high-end sort of thing to have. However, if you happen to have a an actual computer, the investment made more sense because you would get to use the uh, the the CD-ROM, the the CD drive for you know 
a bunch of things, um, including music. So at, at this point in time, the piracy sort of machine had moved steadily, had shifted, transitioned steadily towards the CDs. Pirate CDs, we would still get them from the earlier mentioned uh, newsstands, but this time it was a bit more, uh, it was a bit more of an adventure because the enforcement of the laws had become just slightly more enforcement -y. There would be days when you would go uh, check out the newsstands and every, every one of them would be closed. And then you'd find out uh, earlier that uh, they had heard that some other newsstands in other places of the town got raided and they just closed shop so they wouldn't, wouldn't be caught there. Sometimes this thing would happen from like one end of the marketplace to the other. The, the cops would stop at one of these things and the people on this uh, part would see it. And by the time the cops would get here, everything here was closed. I've seen this happen. I, I, I have seen this happen in real life. One sort of, an, another sort of phenomenon that happened uh, as, a as a result of uh, piracy is that uh, a lot of the games that we experienced back then, we experienced them as part of disc compilations because it didn't make sense to have just one game on one disc that would no one would buy that Those were back extremely then. expensive. Uh, for example, the, the original version of, well, the original, the complete version of Heroes of Might and Magic 3 came on three discs, if I remember correctly. And you had to pay individually the price for each disc. Whereas you could get a, a single disc that had like eight games on it, that you'd be better off for the most of course part. that would change uh, a bit later on but we're not then we're not then yet uh so the idea is that we're a bunch there were a bunch of games and don't think about it necessarily as small games sometimes they were like full length uh, adventure games but or any other type of game but the thing is like usually they had stuff stripped from them like you know music cinematics, anything they could get their hands on anything that was large and that couldn't be compressed to, to smithereens usually got jettisoned for reasons of you know optimizing space like the game would still work without cutscenes and without music so that's how for instance i played heroes of mighty magic 2 most of the heroes of mighty magic 2 i played during that time was musicless i hadn't i had no idea of the music till you know like the 2000 somethings uh, the midi music was still there because they couldn't strip that out because it, it was tiny like it was pointless to strip that out the cd music however did not exist yeah. so for the longest time i did not know that the soundtrack to heroes of Might and magic 2 included different music for the original and different music for the expansion because i only had the one from the expansion the midi version which was it was weird. also also a trick i used to do is because i had uh, I, I never had I, I had only really old computers for most of my well for most of that time up until the end of 2000, 2004 and one of the ways i found that allowed me to run games a bit better was to shut off music and sounds oh yeah so uh, that's something I used to do just in order to be able to play stuff at a bit of a higher FPS instead of it being like... I only that. got a sound card in 2002. Up until then I could run the Unreal Tournament demo on a reasonable playable frame rate. After I installed a sound card, no, it, it no longer worked. Like uh, up until I actually got a sound card, I was a bit upset that games would constantly install sound files which never got used. I only had 800 megabytes of storage, so it, it pissed me off. One aspect that isn't, um, I don't think is also talked about enough because again, it didn't exist in the West necessarily. Although it did exist, but in the same way, is that one of the things that came from uh, piracy is that this allowed us as, uh, let's say a subculture of people like, gamers in general. This allowed us to have a sort of communal and common experience that would be, that is kind of impossible to get nowadays. What I mean by this is basically everyone you knew played the same games. And this meant, because again, like if someone got a new game and usually you would have friends over and you'd show them the game and they'll be like, oh, can I have this? And you're like, sure, of course you can have this. It's like, it's a pirate, you can install it, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the games would spread to like your entire sort of friends group and they would usually also be the same, more or less the same games in other friends groups. 
and this and this kind of gave you a common sort of touchstone was a, a rosetta stone of you communicating with other people you might not know at all but if they happen to mention a game or a computer you'd be like oh do you play games and they're like yeah and like what type and if they'd say something you'd be like oh i play that and that that is something you don't get nowadays uh, that that is one of the disadvantages of uh, having so much so many options and so many possibilities of accessing those options that's that's a different thing this one is just aspect, you know, that's one aspect of uh, culture that really is lost nowadays because people don't really pirate games in the way they used to basically every game uh, used to come with a you know a, its own installer or its own uh, crack uh, file or its own uh, serial key generator and most of them had music yeah they Custom had some made music and th dope they were tunes. absolutely banging like this isn't soft this isn't game related but i used to uh, have a pirated version of borderland c plus plus builder 6 uh, back in the day the music to that is seared into my brain because it, it took two hours to install but it was amazing to listen to that piece it's on youtube i can share the link with you so you can put it in the description if you want to. like it's, it's the link it's just do the music but the music that the the actual video playing on the background is just a picture of the borland c plus plus box because that's where it came from like the person who posted it on youtube knows where they got it they're honest about it there are uh, like signs here and there like uh, about the things we talk about but i've never really seen anyone or anything that truly concentrates them and maybe that's something that's that's been something that i've been trying to do with my uh, bootleg history series for instance uh in which i actually still have pirated game cds this is one of them i haven't covered yet this says uh this is uh, games collection 99 volume 2 it has 10 games on it i've been trying to do this but you know it's it's it, it the, the videos didn't necessarily get the interest or the traction that i would have wanted them to get but you know i'll i'll still make a couple more i have like two or three more compilation discs i think that i can cover it is a part of gaming industry and gaming culture that uh, i feel would also also needs to be preserved at some point my uh, cds i didn't really have a lot of them because they still they were they were cheaper than an actual game but they still got a lot cost a lot of money compared to what i could afford back then i didn't have a lot of them and at some point they did start to degrade so i uh i moved them to dvds at some point i added I'm, to them once yeah. i got internet because i'm a dirty filthy pirate i'm lucky these cds are still by the way they still work <laughs> most of them still i think all of them basically still work i had to get an optical drive to actually uh, image them and uh read them and then Im image them for conservation purposes especially but also to get to work with them for the videos easier easier i'm surprised that 25 year old discs still run and it's a bit of a i gotta give these pirates props for doing some really so i can't see what it says on it magic yeah, the gathering it's, okay it's, yeah this is chandelier so <laughs> it's the og one for burning some serious stuff like i don't know they they just don't make uh, blank cds i guess like they used because these things still run 25 years later i was also lucky like, that i didn't throw these out like i did with my tapes or other stuff instead these existed in like a very sheltered corner of a wooden cupboard so they were also uh, protected from like dampness or stuff like that the idea is you've mentioned cost uh, here and there for that time for like the the end of the 90s right up into the start of the 2000s even if you got a compilation disc they could still cost a fair bit but again like you said you would get in this case 10 games you would get a bunch of games um at a certain point more and more people started gaining access to cd writer and we could start basically just burning the games on our own blank discs and just redistributing those to our friends this this comes in parallel with you know the technology developing on its own and the general economic capabilities improving in the country and access so there were more discs out there the cost went down it was easier to burn them the competition also increased because more people started having access to the internet and uh, we wouldn't really see games on the newsstands any longer they shifted to what i like to call burn on order and what these are what, what this is is literally what it sounds like you would basically just order 
the game you wanted and in a couple of days uh, someone would bring it how did how this worked is the cooler way which again back to your earlier point like it, it's a shame this never actually crystallized and condensed into something bigger because these people had the networks set up they had the pipeline set up but i guess they weren't actually interested in games they were just interested in making money it was literally netflix like netflix started like that well, they didn't have the piracy angle but they just shipped you a disc with the movie you wanted for a price so how this worked at the beginning of the 2000s, like the first half of the 2000s, I was in high school back then. And how this worked is basically at a certain point, someone in the class would present a catalog this what well, there was a catalog it didn't have images because by that point in time we already had at least two to three video game magazines dedicated to talk about gaming so again if you were into gaming you were likely into getting the magazines or you know a couple of you pulled money and you got the magazine and you knew the you knew the titles that were being talked about attention to that if i may i found this and i think you just bought this game like two days ago yeah, yeah, Conquest, the Final Frontier. Yeah, I found it from 2001. This nice. is the demo I played for like several weeks. Yeah. It's worth noting that uh, these kind of demo discs from magazine, for magazines were one of the reasons that piracy sort of, maybe it it didn't, uh, like maybe it slowed its acceleration a bit because people could just play these for a long time because these demos, they were hefty back in the day. Some of them were like really long. Like you could play them for weeks and months, depending on how well they were programmed. You could reset, I don't know, their time counter or something like, uh, you could remove the limitation that was imposed in the, in the demo itself. Oh, uh, the uh, the Diablo spawned uh, version, the Diablo demo. There were rumors, there was, uh, people kept telling me, oh, there's a way to get past the fourth level. It's hidden there. You can just, you can, if you tweak some files, if you cast this spell at this moment, you could probably get, below the the moment where the demo stops it was like this entire subculture of uh, urban insanity myths, of basically urban, yeah it's it's basically the, the the conspiracy theorists of today used to tell me that you could get to the last level of diablo in the spawn version now looking back very amusing uh, sort of phenomena to look at and study you had these catalogs that had like they were nicely printed generally they were just a list of games and the amount of the number of uh, discs the game would require this where we are past generally we're kind of past the compilation stage because again prices have went down per disc and people are now aware because of the internet and of these magazines they're aware of, of you know cutscenes and music and stuff like that because of this you can afford to get heroes 3 on all the three discs or the equivalent as we move uh, into like the first part of the 2000s toward the mid so you would have the catalog where you have the title the and the number of discs it requires and you would just have to pay per disc it didn't matter the game the game didn't matter, you just had to pay the amount of discs it required to be stored on. And that would, you know, the, the amount per disc would vary depending on, you know, who the catalog creator was. This made the, the full, so the, the full experience of the games much more attainable because as I was saying, you would generally have like a group of friends who are gamers. Hopefully, if each of you had a certain amount of money, you wouldn't all get the same goddamn game because you weren't dumb. Each of you would get one game that all of you wanted and then you would share it amongst yourselves. By that point in time, it, it wasn't uh, super cheap for us at that point, but it was much more affordable than it would have been five years earlier and definitely way more affordable than what the actual licensed, we used to call them licensed, uh, what the actual original legal license game would be, assuming you would gain access to that because even in the shops that sold original games, licensed games, you would only find like the super duper extra mega popular stuff. For instance, I got Arcanum of Steam Wars and Magic Obscura through one of these catalogs. I still have that disc or those discs. I don't know if it was on two discs or one. I couldn't afford the original one anyway, but I knew I wouldn't find it anyway because this, like, it wasn't it wasn't Diablo. Like, I knew this wouldn't appeal to everyone. I, I have, I, I still have the Arcanum. I still have the Fallout that I bought similarly somewhere. I don't think I have them here. I think I have them back in the in the old country, as it were. Actual fun fact, um, around 2003, I won uh, an IT... Uh... A con a contest in the, in the city and uh, they gave me prize, my prize money which 
amazing thing to have. And I wanted to buy Deus Ex, like actually buy it because I couldn't find it anywhere. Like in pirated version, uh, the the store that used to sell the pirated games closed. I mean, they closed the the part part. So I went to actually buy Deus Ex from a store, and they didn't have it. But they did have Arcanum, which ah. I already had as a pirate version. <laughs> We did live in different areas, so it depends. Finding a, a box, Arcanum. I don't have an Arcanum menu. Even in a clamshell, I haven't found one. But yeah, getting a box one. one. Uh, best, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, it could be Best yeah. Buy or Sold Out. Best I have value, a, yeah, sold yeah, out. Yeah, I have sold a bunch. Out. So I'm really enjoying, uh, at a certain point, we'll talk about collecting physical. Despite them looking, uh, you know, pretty bland and whatnot, like the, I'm, I'm enjoying the the consistent homogenous nature of the sold out covers and this is about the sort of time where piracy in general shifts completely online by the time of 2000 in between 2004 and 2006 the one the one thing the one the sole thing that worked as intended in Romania the one situation in which the free market worked as intended in Romania was the spread of broadband internet and i have my theories on why that happened but the idea is even today romania has top five speed to cost internet globally in between 2004 and 2006 an increasingly larger number of people with computers who were into it could gain um, access to really good internet compared to dial-up and compared even to the west of europe around that time for instance i had <laughs> thinking back now i had 50ks 50kbs oh, yeah. that's what i started with at in the summer of 2004 and i still i up to this day i tell my mom i got the cable uh, hooked up three days before my baccalaureate which is basically uh, which is basically like the end the, the the finals in high school it's like the sats for americans <clears throat> kind of kind of kind of or you know the finals of like the, the exams you need to pass it to come successfully finish high school and i i've been telling mom ever since then i'm like i'm glad this happened three days before because i didn't plug it in i, I knew because uh, i told her like if i had this a year prior i don't know if i would have actually finished high school but you would have been happier by that in between 2004 and 06 more people you know not just not, not just myself could gain access to pretty good speed internet and that birthed different uh a separate different sort of piracy subcultures initially focused around dc plus plus in parallel at a certain point we had found out about this peer-to-peer -peer thing which it was big for music but you know games sort of moved like that here and there but dc plus plus was the main thing for movies especially and at a certain point if you were really deep well not really deep but if you were really into seeking stuff out and uh, in various sort of uh, on various sort of dc plus plus servers someone at a certain point would mention the word torrent and if you were interested you would look that up and then and then torrents happened that shifted the piracy uh, culture online and distribution as well for a lot of people most people i want to say because again it made and that's and that's when uh, steam comes uh, into existence by the way you know when i installed steam the first time when they gave out the portal the first the first slice no no no. i installed steam uh, the first time because uh, it was required for half-life 2 Oh, so, yeah, um, and it was you, you would still you would crack it. You it, it would still be cracked. Don't think you know. No, no, no. It was still cracked back then. You could still it didn't have to connect or shit like that. But it just needed Steam to work. Steam uh, sort of built itself on becoming a solution for piracy. That it it let you buy games and uh, you know uh, get them without having to pirate because they were available to you anywhere you were on the internet. It wasn't the only uh, uh, system that let you do that. Impulse let you do that as well and predated by I think two or three years. But uh, Impulse didn't have the killer app and uh, Steam had it. Steam bought it. They bought, uh, Valve bought Counter-Strike and made it mandatory to use Steam to, to play it. That's how piracy died in internet cafes because you couldn't play Counter-Strike anymore without a Steam account. It, 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 Valve just opened the gate on like a giant horde of money and it just came flooding their way because everybody still wanted to play Counter-Strike. 
everybody still wanted. There were competitions that suddenly had to pay them a bunch of money to continue to exist and they weren't small competitions like in Romania, the PGL. It was the biggest gaming competition, the biggest gaming, professional gaming scene we had. It wasn't as big as the ESL, the European Sports League or whatever the Americans had, the, uh, the other thing, I forget what its name is. But it's still, it was big and it got money from basically every internet cafe that still wanted to let people play Counter-Strike online. So buying exclusive works, people, it works. At least at, uh, at least back then. Um, it, it, cause no, it, no, it does really. Yeah, it, it, it did. Like the presence of Steam did change things. But even that, like Unicom is describing it as this uh, flood. It was it was more of a trick that did happen for like the 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 counter strike things and you know half life and stuff but in reality it would take still several many years until pricing would also be a bit more region sort of aware because that was that was Actually, still an issue something something i wanted to mention earlier uh when we're talking about our cam there was uh an effort made early on to price games more accordingly to what you could afford and the biggest one that comes to mind like the one that was like heralded as the game that you can actually afford was speedbusters i don't know if you remember the game it was it was i think it was a ubisoft it was it had a, the weirdest intro it was sort of like uh, raising arizona combined with a racing game where the cop chases a guy and at the end the guy has a, like a flower in his I'm gonna show you the intro, and you can put it in the background. Anyway, yeah, I will. That game, um, not that 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 not that great of a game, but it was the cheapest game you could get. Like me and my brother were discussing, should we get it because we we can we can almost afford it, and we decided not to at the end because it was just another racing game, and we had Carmageddon, and that was enough for us, and we had Need for Speed too. But uh, that, was, that, that was an attempt. I'm not sure if it was super successful. I know a bunch of people bought it, but I don't think it was super duper successful until like later on when uh, oh, in 2011 we had regional pricing that was really like on point. Deus Ex, the uh, Mankind, no, Deus Ex Human Evolution, the the, re, the, the first one, yeah. uh, came out at a price of 70 lei, which is currently it, it would be about $12. Back then, I think it was 17 or $20, but still, the, I, I had to ask the store, is this just for the pre-order and you're going to charge me more to get it? No, 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 this is the price. That was amazing. I couldn't afford it back then, but still, it was amazing. To sort of try to bring things back, like, of course, we went very quickly through things. Hopefully, we managed to touch on several important things. Arguably, one of the, uh, the, 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 the elephants in the room that we need to also address because we've been talking about games and hardware. But in the background of all of this was OS piracy. In the background of all of this was were the innumerable Windows, like academic versions of Windows. I used to love having an academic version of Windows because those were the bomb that would get installed and, you know, cracked. And at a certain point, I remember during the XP era, I had internet but I wouldn't allow it to connect because we were always paranoid that it would be like, oh, hey, you're not licensed. Hey, bro, no. What we would do is basically there were websites where the people would upload the update packages and we would just take the package down and install the package separately without connecting to the internet and we would have an updated XP. And I rocked, I rocked XP Service Pack 3 for so long. I think that was maybe one of the best looking at its entirety of, I think XP Service Pack 3 may, may, may have been the best OS, the best Windows for gaming because it allowed, it, it, it worked with things that were being released then and for a couple of years afterwards, but it also still allowed you to pretty much play or most the, things from the 90s. Some things needed to be fixed and I had a lot of issues with games like Oni and I think uh, some version of Max Payne that I had didn't work properly on it. But with time you, you could get things to work and for things that didn't work you had DOS box because you know uh, XP removed the DOS shell which was kind of still yeah. useful for some games. Par ensemble in general I still think XP Service Pack 3 was maybe maybe like the in general the best sort of one like I used it I liked it so much that I completely skipped Vista because I was, we were looking, we were, we were like, okay, let's see what's going on. It was like, no, fail, nope, sucks, nope, nope, I'll just, I'll just keep it. Service Pack 3 works. 
and even then with 7 I think I switched to 7 like a year and a half after it was released but after I would read about like oh it's good for gaming now and I'm like okay fine I can I can get a pirated version of it obviously as someone who used Windows Millennium in B yeah I used Windows Millennium I was shocked that it removed the the DOS shell which I still needed to play games sadly but it, it some things work better and I skipped over Vista as well and I think I got I got Windows 7 in 2011. I had a, I had a colleague, I had a, a high school uh, colleague who, uh, for reasons unknown to me, and I don't think known to him either, he was into trying Millennium. And I shit you not, he had, he would reinstall that motherfucker once every two to three weeks. He had to do a fresh install, a fresh reinstall, because it, it, it would, it would just, it would, it would just not work anymore. There, there were some issues with some programs that would absolutely destroy explorer.exe if you try to rebind the uh, files to it. You ha I had to reinstall it three times in a single day because of BS Player would uh, just destroy it when trying to attach video files to itself. And that is exactly the point I was going. I was going to get to because, like I said, in the in the background there was there was also proper software piracy, and not just com not just video game piracy. Generally, we all ran unlicensed pirated versions of windows and any other software that we needed it was most likely like he mentioned the bs player that was the popular uh, video playback uh, software cracked uh winamp i don't think that one needed to be cracked but yeah we... you, if you wanted the pro version that could rip files or write files at a certain bit rate yeah you needed the pro version otherwise the normal one worked fine this and you also mentioned earlier borland c plus plus same thing antiviruses that was a bit more difficult yeah, the, we, the, the, we had northern system works crack yeah. we had a bunch of, we we cracked everything it was it was if it if it existed eventually it would get cracked if you, if you allow me there's there's a quote i want to share with you on the 10th of august 2007 microsoft opened its bucharest uh, development uh, location like up until then you would have local support you know they were outsourced but that's when we got our actual Microsoft Studio, Microsoft Development Studio, the the actual headquarters where they could develop software for Microsoft and Microsoft would hire people. And on that day, on the 10th of August, 2007, our then president, who is a sailor and pirate because he used to do a lot of shady stuff on, on the seas, uh, he said to Bill Gates's face, piracy helped the young generation discover computer. It set off the development of the IT industry in Romania. It helped Romanians improve their creative capacity in the IT industry, which has become famous around the world. Ten years ago, it was an investment in Romania's friendship with Microsoft and with Bill Gates. And then he left, <laughs> like he used to, and told us, live well, and then left and sold the, the commercial fleet for pennies. And that's the, and, and that is the, that is an encapsulation of the point I want to make. I, I don't want this to sound more uh, aggrandizing than it actually is. I, I, I hope we did a decent enough job at presenting what piracy meant to us from our perspective and for, from our context. And the truth of the matter is software piracy bridged the technological gap I was talking about at the beginning. It bridged the eastern part of Europe and the west after the fall of the Iron Curtain. That is software piracy if we wouldn't have had it things would not only be way more different now but i'm pretty sure technologically speaking you know socioeconomically as well things would be in a worse off position and that is that that is the hill i will not die on i will live and defend because i know i'm right because i it, lived it and it's not just software piracy all the bootleg vhs tapes that gave us an insight into the culture of people from across the wall. That those were illegal as well. And without those, we we would have had so much less in common with uh, our fellows from the Western Bloc. We we wouldn't we wouldn't know who Jean Claude Van Damme was. We wouldn't know if he could or could not beat Bruce Lee. We wouldn't know how to get to the chopper. We 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 have we would basically have no uh, ground, no common ground to understand each other. We did that through piracy. Piracy is good. 
for us, maybe not for the people who own the media, but it's not like they're doing great under, you know, the absolute uh, hellscape of capitalism now. It's like, uh, <laughs> Hopefully the point we made uh, reach through any other still valid and parallel discussion related to, you know, the uh, ethical uh, considerations and the copyright considerations of that. What we wanted to do is like, uh, like I said at the beginning, I wanted, we wanted to have a different discussion, a different have a, a different type of discourse about piracy and give you a very, very personal and very real at the same time and different sort of take on it based on where and when I hope maybe this video um, gets seen by uh, by people who have literally no idea of where we come from or maybe they do but I hope it gives them a bit more extra context why some of us some some portion of the population some people somewhere have a very knowledgeable and arguably reasonable soft spot for uh, the concept at least, at least the concept of piracy in general. Uh, when we're talking about software and stuff, not necessarily talking about uh, the actual, uh, about actual uh, acts of uh, piracy on the seas and whatnot, unless they're in the, you know, uh, in the, like Pirates of the Caribbean uh, set, uh, set stuff, not, you know, real world. Sh the, the, this has been our uh, sort of uh, piracy special, maybe not really. It's just a normal episode of what uh, of what we hope uh, Game Chronicles uh, can offer, has offered up until now, and we can offer in the future. Definitely leave us some comments about uh, this subject matter. It would be great to know where and when you come from, if you're comfortable with uh, sharing that. But uh, giving us your sort of take on it uh, and your sort of take on how we tried to explain where we're coming from would also be useful because generally the discussion that takes place around piracy is about uh, has to do with copyright and that sort of stuff and that's very valid but again the things we talked about aren't talked about and we feel they need to be talked about and known because this type of long-term and very deep impact that, that a phenomenon like piracy can have needs to be looked at in context and it needs to be looked at from a historical perspective from a uh, you know uh, socio-economical perspective um, anthropological perspective and also technological perspective as well so hopefully we did a decent enough job at that hopefully we were sufficiently entertaining let's say uh, to keep your uh, interests alive uh, up until next time i've been steven nonsense I've been here to Hey, if you want to dive deeper into this, I suggest uh, looking up. Uh, there's a couple of articles written by Andrada Fiscutano, uh, Fiscutano, it would be in English, uh, about the bootlegs in the Balkans and uh, you know even our own cobras and yeah, yeah. Bootleg, I think I can. Uh, I think I can. Uh, I think I can link those in the description for those interested. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.